I want to welcome you all to the fourth session of the SCAFA series, Socialist Perspectives on Public Health. SCAFA is the Socialist Caucus of the American Public Health Association. Today, our speaker is Alice Rothschild. She is a physician, author, filmmaker, and activist focused on Israel and Palestine. Today, she'll talk about Israel-Palestine, examining healthcare under occupation, ethical and medical realities. I will post her list of further readings in the chat and we'll send it in about a week to everyone who is registered with Eventbrite. Alice? Oh, we will have question and answer period after Alice's talk. Well, and, okay. Thank you very much for that uh, introduction. Uh, so I'm going to just jump right in and hopefully my slides will behave themselves. So the first thing I'm going to do is focus on some of the ethical questions when we think about healthcare in this region, uh, thinking about international law, uh, collective civilian punishment, restrictions of access, uh, ghettoization, not only of Palestinians in, under occupation, but what happens when Israelis are ghettoizing themselves, incarceration, especially of children, and the proportionality in war. And the important thing is to remember that healthcare and healing occur in a socio-political context. So we need uh, to look at political solutions for health and human rights issues. And one way to just think about this is why is life expectancy in Israel 10 years longer than in the West Bank and Gaza? So I wanna just say that some amazing things happened in 2021. Uh, Beth Selim, which is an Israeli human rights organization that has been very hesitant to come out and actually call things the way many of us think they are, came out this year um, saying that a regime that uses laws and practices and organized violence to establish and maintain the supremacy of one group over another is an apartheid regime. The accumulation of measures which receive public and judicial support and are enshrined in both practice and law points to the conclusion that uh, the bar for defining Israel as an apartheid state has been met. So this is a very big deal that an Israeli human rights organization would say this. The other thing that happened is that uh, Human Rights Watch, which has also been, you know, somewhat good at reporting what's going on, but not 100%, uh, stated this year, um, laws, policies, and statements by leading Israeli officials make plain that the objective of maintaining Jewish-Israeli control over demographics, political power, land, has long guided governmental policy, and then in pursuing these goals, authorities have dispossessed, confined, forcibly separated and subjugated Palestinians. And they say these deprivations are so severe that they amount to the crimes against humanity of apartheid and persecution. So those two announcements were really big. And let's see if I can get this to advance. Okay. So the other question I want us to think about is what is the relationship between Zionism and medicine? And in 2018, um, the Israeli Knesset, their parliament, uh, uh, made the nation state bill, which officially privileged Jewish citizens of Israel over Palestinians. This was recently upheld by the Supreme Court. So it's a basically a statement of a, a official institutional racism. And the question we have to ask is, are Jewish Israeli clinicians able to see Palestinian citizens of Israel or Palestinians in the occupied territories as fellow equal human beings? And when I think about the right to health, I'm using a definition that was uh, created by the Physicians for Human Rights Israel. It's used by other groups as well in, in its most broad sense. So we're talking about freedom of movement, access to health services, clean water, sanitation, nutrition, housing, education, employment, and the right to live in a nonviolent society. And just uh, to put this all in perspective, the picture on the right is a picture I took of a health pamphlet uh, put out by the Palestinian Medical Relief Society for pregnant women, along with, you know, breastfeeding is good and eat your calcium and blah, blah, blah. This was what to do if you're caught in labor at a checkpoint. Now, healthcare in the West Bank and Gaza was described in the Lancet as fragmented and incoherent. We have a population of over 5 million people. The Ministry of Health was established after the Oslo Accords in 1994, ostensibly to create a viable healthcare system and run it. Uh, the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, which is UNRWA, 
uh, cares for refugees. So I'm going to be focusing on Gaza. So we got about a hundred, one and a half million Gazans in eight camps, and their healthcare is organized by UNRWA. Then we have a host of non-governmental organizations. People talk about the NGOization of the West Bank and Gaza. It's pretty striking when you're there. Then there are private providers. And then on top of this is the role of the Israeli government, basically in their policy of de-development and restricting uh, the education and development of the health sector. Now, as we think about all these things, we need to put it in the overriding perspective of the Geneva Conventions, which basically say that an occupying power is not allowed to um, prevent uh, medical people to do their uh, work and they're supposed to be able to do their humanitarian functions. So as I said, I would like to focus on Gaza because it is the most forgotten place. And um, the West Bank has other uh, similar issues, not quite as extreme, but similar. And I'm happy to talk about that in the um, Q&A, as well as what's going on in Israel. Uh, so one of the things to remember is that in 2020, uh, the UN said Gaza, before 2020, the UN said Gaza would not be habitable by 2020. We're now a year after that. So Gaza is a sort of been for a long time, a very desperate, humanitarian catastrophe, there's a siege, the water is polluted and salinated, there are incredible issues around healthcare, nutrition, fuel, electricity, treatment of sewage, adequate housing. And then on top of that, you put the environmental contamination of military uh, maneuvers and bombs and all the stuff gets dropped on Gaza. Um, then layer that on with the climate crisis. This is a place in the world that's getting hotter. Gaza is basically at sea level. And then you throw in a pandemic for extra credit. So in this year, the big issues for Gaza are, you know, the lack of electricity, um, fuel shortages that have actually led to hospitals closing. Um, there's a lack of specialists because people can't get advanced training. The people that are there are exhausted. Uh, many uh, don't get paid or get paid a partial amount of their salaries. There have been increasing restrictions on permits to leave Gaza, not only for patients, but for people who work for NGOs and for the UN. And just as an example, 20% of the patients who have been denied permits have cancer, which can't be treated on the strip. And then there is the pandemic. So pre-pandemic, uh, there was an incredible depletion of supplies. Almost half of uh, drugs were missing, a third of medical supplies, two thirds of lab and blood bank needs, uh, PPEs, because Israel controls the imports and exports of everything. And even available drugs were often unaffordable. And one of the consequences of the Great March of Return, which was almost two years, 2018, 2019, was that there were almost 8,000 people who were uh, wounded with gunshot wounds, as well as 33,000 plus who were injured. And 88% of mostly the young men who were uh, shot at had limb wounds because the snipers had a policy of shooting out their legs. So there was a massive amount of orthopedic injury and need for orthopedic care, uh, which was very difficult to meet in Gaza due to the lack of specialization and supplies. And this was taxing the healthcare system as well. And in terms of water, there was a study by RAND which showed that water pollution is the main cause of morbidity and mortality in Gaza, partly because of overpumping of the aquifers, lack of repairs after each attack. And when we talk about, you know, someone having 48 hours of water, we're not talking about potable water, we're just talking about water. 95% of the water is not drinkable. And the other um, impact of Israel bombing the sewage treatment plants is that there's an equivalent of 43 Olympic sized swimming pools of untreated wastewater that are dumped into the sea every day. And I've been in Gaza three times. This was a picture I actually took of what's called Wadi Gaza, which is a sea of sewage flowing into the beautiful Mediterranean. So 70% of the beaches are now contaminated. Now, um, in 2018, in the previous Trumpian universe, uh, they uh, slashed um, UNWAR funding um, at a time of incredible desperation, poverty, malnutrition, etc. And at that point, the World Bank said Gaza's economy is collapsing. The Ministry of Health talked about uh, everything was in a state of emergency. And Trump also cut aid to Al Makassid Hospital in East Jerusalem, which is the main uh, tertiary care level hospital that people go for high level care. Now, uh, Biden has uh, reversed this policy a bit. In March, he gave 15 million, a range for 15 million for COVID assistance. Uh, USAID kicked in with Catholic relief for COVID assistance as well and food assistance. And when I sort of totaled up what UNRWA has gotten this year, it's up to 319 million, uh, but it's still uh, not enough for what UNRWA needs to be doing. 
And the other thing I want to remind people um, who are familiar with the Israeli siege is it's not only a strict control of everything going in and out in the air and the sea, but there are other maneuvers that Israeli uh, uh, soldiers do, like fumigating farmlands along the border fence with herbicides, including Roundup, which not only toxifies the environment, but hurts people. The fishing industry has been decimated by severely fishing, limiting fishing zones, and this is a fishing industry. And there was also some documentation of intentional flooding of agricultural uh, zones next to the border uh, perimeter fence, uh, where that's the most fertile agriculture. So all these things uh, make everything worse. And in 2012, uh, this guy who was working in Gaza wrote, and this was in Lancet, when you are living in hell and someone turns up the heat a little, it doesn't change much. You're still living in hell. And now it's 2012 and nothing has changed year after year. Now, what I found is that people, you know, are alive and living in Gaza. And so some of the interesting things I think we need to talk about are resiliency. Women are the center of strength in the family. The families are very uh, strong um, as, a, as a social structure. And, you know, I interviewed and worked with all sorts of teachers and doctors and psychologists, all sorts of people with a lot of education, with farmers, fishermen, all sorts of people. And, you know, the basic message was we don't want charity. We want the freedom to live our lives and be able to be self-sufficient. And if you want a really good idea of what it's like to actually live there, I work with a group called We Are Not Numbers, which mentors young Gazan writers, and their essays are then put on the website, We Are Not Numbers, and I urge people to see what these young people say in terms of their lives. Now, I did a lot of focusing on the pandemic. I was very impressed at the beginning that no one was really watching what was going on. So I started uh, through Jewish Voice for Peace, a weekly COVID-19 uh, timeline, uh, which is still coming out. You can see it at jvphealth.org. So just to show you, I've been tracking, you know, I thought this would be a couple of months, ha ha ha. Um, so the, uh, the um, Horizontal line is every week and the vertical line is number of people with COVID. So you can see in blue, uh, Israel has had several humps and they are now having a little upswing because of Delta variant. Um, the uh, West Bank, it's hard to see this because their numbers are so much lower, but they've had significant upswings. And then um, I will give you more information about Gaza. East Jerusalem is hard to understand, um, mostly because we don't have a lot of data about East Jerusalem. So there were a lot of challenges in just following these numbers, which gives you a sense of what's wrong with the healthcare system. First of all, there was an inadequate number of testing capacities. So everything is an undercount. The thing on the right is what the WHO information looks like. And then there was all this confusion. The Palestinian Health Ministry uh, data that they recorded uh, was in the West Bank and Gaza, and it was listed under Palestine, then it was changed to occupied territories, and then it went under Israel. So, you know, I kept wondering, like, where are these numbers and why do they keep changing? Even Johns Hopkins, which is an esteemed place, had a dashboard that basically erased Palestinians. They kept changing the name of what the people were. Um, and there's been an extreme lack of testing in Gaza since May. So when we look at this, um, this is a, a real example of medical apartheid. Now, what do I mean by that? So uh, during the Oslo Accords, the Palestinian Authority uh, established, uh, was established and having responsibility for the management of healthcare in the territories. However, before Oslo, we have the Geneva Accords, which state that an occupying power is responsible uh, to the people they're occupied um, for the treatment, prophylactic, preventive, all that kind of stuff for contagious diseases and epidemics. And most people who look at international law feel that the Geneva Accords supersede Oslo. So basically what we see is that Israel wants Palestinians in the territories to have the responsibilities of sovereignty, providing health care, without the benefits of sovereignty, having resources and control over the system. So the response to the pandemic really depends on your geographic, ethnic, and political status in the region. So why do I call this medical apartheid? Well, the thing to remember is that Israel is a first world country. It has top-notch healthcare facilities. They've got their issues, I understand this, but in the world they're top-notch. And they began you know, data sharing with Pfizer very early. They put out a ton of money to get vaccines quickly. Um, and you know, they, there were all these issues around medical privacy and whitewashing by the media, but whatever. They had what was called a successful vaccination rollout despite major obstacles reaching Palestinian citizens and ultra-Orthodox Jews who didn't read the newspaper and didn't believe in science. Um, but they totally denied responsibility for vaccinating 
people, uh, Palestinians under occupation, as well as prisoners in Israeli jails and workers. There are tens of thousands of workers in Israel from the West Bank um, and workers in the settlements. They just close their eyes. And they also had less resources and care to Palestinian citizens in Israel. In East Jerusalem and Area C, Area C is the part of the West Bank, which is totally controlled by Israel. Uh, COVID-19 clinics uh, put up by the PA were closed, smashed, you know, destroyed. Testing was prohibited. UNRWA kits were destroyed. And just recently in Hebron, they demolished a building that was up for quarantine, people needing to quarantine because it didn't have a permit. So there you have it. Um, and even when at the beginning, COVID cases in Israel were 40 times greater than um, in uh, the territories, Israel closed the West Bank as a precaution, but not the settlers. The settlers could still come in and out. Now I'm going to focus on Gaza, um, mostly because no one is. And first of all, I think we have to understand that there was an incredible lack of testing. So you can see for a long time there was no COVID and then there was community spread and there have been several major humps. And this area here is all very poor um, data collection. So I don't think you can actually believe that. So um, before the pandemic hit, this was a very high risk population. There was a lot of obesity, diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, hunger, uh, very few hospital beds. There were maybe 120 ICU beds, maybe 100 ventilators. Um, and so this was a humanitarian, territorial, demographic and political medical crisis before everything hit. And so um, uh, the Ministry of Health was very aware of this. And so um, uh, they knew that they couldn't cope with a pandemic. So for five months, they had total quarantine of anyone who came in, and this was a public health victory. Then in August, uh, COVID erupted. There was a lockdown in the middle of nightly Israeli strikes. And during this total closure, they had no fuel, electricity was four hours a day, and people are locked down in their homes. Um, and this lack of electricity, as you can imagine, had a huge impact on hospitals. This is an ICU in Gaza for babies. Um, so it jeopardized the hospitals, waste disposal, all those kinds of things. And you can think people are uh, confined to their homes without refrigeration. Um, and meanwhile, Israel is maintaining its full closure. Um, and so the number of patients in Gazan hospitals exceeded capacity by October. There was some intervention by Qatari, but um, the Gazans were really um, having trouble. And then in March, uh, there was a big uptake. Almost 2,000 Gazan health workers tested positive. Um, Gaza began to receive a trickle of doses of, vac of vaccines uh, from a variety of sources. And then um, in April, there was another spike. Um, the positivity rate for testing at that point was one positive out of three tests. Again, trickles of vaccines coming in from all over the place. And then we have in May a, a massive assault on the medical system with the assault on Gaza. So um, during the 11 days of assault, no vaccines could get in to the region. Uh, the only testing center was damaged. Hospitals and clinics were damaged. And you can imagine the people who were injured in the bombings took priority over the people who just couldn't breathe from COVID. The hospital was, ex the population was extremely traumatized and people fled to UNRWA schools and to their relatives. So there was a large number of people crowded together without water, without basic hygiene. So you can imagine this was like a Petri dish for COVID to um, make its ugly surge. And then the Delta variant got into Gaza and by now, um, by July, only 11% of people in all of the territories has been vaccinated. I can't find numbers for Gaza in particular. So from my point of view, they should be having a massive surge right now. And the fact that we haven't seen it doesn't mean it's not happening. It's a young population and we may not ever know how much COVID is in Gaza. So at this point, 90% of the cases in the territories are in Gaza. And again, the same lack of medicine, fuel, et cetera, et cetera, persist, lack of ICU beds, oxygen, all that kind of stuff. There's also poor access to COVID-19 vaccines and PPEs um, and a very high risk of infection. Around 5,000 medical personnel have now become ill with COVID. And then there's vaccine hesitancy in the population. So um, not surprisingly, as the population sort of quarantined within their usual uh, quarantine, uh, mental health issues spiked. There was an increase in gender-based violence, poverty. Uh, there was a spike in requests to leave for health reasons and for you know, this 
craziness between the PA and Hamas. PA refused to coordinate these permits, so a bunch of NGOs stepped in. And this is a picture of Erez crossing, which is where I would get in and other people will get in. This is uh, October, there was 2% of the normal traffic. So you can just imagine how shut down the place is. Um, all was not completely terrible because there's a huge amount of strength and ingenuity in civil society. So as this pandemic spread, we saw teachers using radio and social media to teach because kids didn't have um, you know, electricity, computers, that kind of thing. Artists launched a face mask initiative. There were sewing factories that were making gowns and masks, and they were working sweatshop laborers, eight to $12 a day, and taking orders, believe it or not, from Israel who uses them when they need them. There were Gazans uh, doing 3D printing face shields, and the Gaza Community Mental Health Program, which is an essential part of mental health care, uh, developed a whole crisis response plan. Uh, but you know, when you step back and look at the whole thing, this is really a big picture of structural racism, apartheid, and cross-generational trauma. The Israelis uh, do rely on military solutions with a real disregard for the health and lives of Palestinians. Whenever Israel would give some token of equipment or training, they thought they were being so generous and so humanitarian um, and ignoring the fact that as an occupier, they're actually responsible. There was also a rise in digital and algorithmic surveillance um, in the name of public health. And actually, this has leaked into Israeli society as well. Um, so we call that occupation creep, but it's just another part of this whole picture. So what we see is that the man-made inequalities in intricate and structural ways diminish people's chances of survival. And that the COVID-19 pandemic has made it clear that the health of Palestinians is intrinsically linked to their liberation and to the end of the siege. And there was a very important uh, issue of the Journal of Palestine Studies in October on the pandemic and Palestine. And my friend Danya Kato, Kato wrote, public health then for Palestinians is inextricable from the ongoing Israeli settler colonial project of dispossession and erasure and from the capitalist policies and practices that undergird that project in Palestine in the camps and diaspora communities. And she said, COVID-19 pandemic unmasks the complexities of these relationships, as well as the enduring role that racism, racial capitalism, heteropatriarchy, settler colonialism, white supremacy have played in obstructing clinical medicine and public health globally. So she kind of called everything out and put it in a global context. So the big issues that we still have are who is responsible for vaccinating occupied Palestinians, prisoners, workers in Israel? Is this charity or obligation? We have the Palestinian authorities negotiating with a host of different countries and groups and NGOs and COVAX to get um, this trickle of vaccine into uh, the occupied territories. We see vaccine washing and politicalization. And the Israelis have this fantasy of herd immunity thinking that if they just vaccinate themselves, that somehow the fact that they are surrounded by unvaccinated Palestinians with variants that are gonna happen, um, that, that, that somehow they can have herd immunity, which is pretty delusional. So you can argue that not only does Israel have a moral and legal uh, reason to be vaccinating Palestinians, but it also would be in their self-interest. And again, medical apartheid, currently 11% of Palestinians have been vaccinated and over 60% of Israelis are fully vaccinated. And Israel is actually considering a third dose and starting to vaccinate children. And today on NPR, I just, I'm throwing this in, in the apartheid restriction department, Israel is still not allowing any construction materials into Gaza. So Gaza is like stuck in the post-assault dark ages. And you have to ask, what if there had been an end to the siege? What if, Gazans had had economic autonomy and food production. It's a very fertile area. If they could rebuild their infrastructure, if they could develop their medical and public health institutions, Gazans are highly educated. They have the skill set to do this. There is a pharmaceutical company in Gaza. What if it could have produced vaccines? So we see that this medical crisis is really nested in the militarism, the neoliberalism, the capitalism, the inequity, which is a central tenant. So this is not an individual problem, but a systemic crisis of settler colonialism, racism, and white supremacy that is part of our wonderful global order. And I see the crux of the problem is this. The status quo can only continue if we as human beings see Jews as more human, more deserving, more innocent, more honorable than Palestinian Arabs. And if we as a community are blind to Arab suffering. So the fundamental issue again comes down to racism, which potentially leads to ethnic cleansing and genocide.
And, but, and my final comments is going to be about academic censorship of Palestine in the medical world. And I'm just going to start with two examples. Um, we know the Lancet has been very uh, willing to wade into political issues. This is when a, um, a journal when they were criticizing Bush for his response to the AIDS epidemic. So uh, in 2020, they published an article that said, pandemics will cause more damage to populations burdened by poverty, military occupation, discrimination, and institutionalized oppression. And then they urged uh, the community, the international community, to end structural violence that's being inflicted on Palestinians. And they said, you know, the pandemic cripples Gaza's healthcare system, and that the pandemic should not be viewed as an inevitable biomedical phenomenon experienced equally by the world's population, but as a preventable biosocial injustice rooted in decades of Israeli oppression and international complicity. Now, I read this, and this is like obvious to me, common sense couldn't find anything wrong with the statement, but under severe pressure, boycott, you know, harassment of individuals and the uh, journal, uh, Lancet withdrew this letter and they published a rebuttal. And so that's one of the states we see in uh, the medical academic world. Um, and the most recent uh, kerfluffle uh, was the retraction of a Scientific American opinion piece that was published in June called As Healthcare Workers We Stand in Support of Palestine. And these very brave souls talked about the impact of Israeli violence, the impact of the latest attack, violations of international law, complicity of the US government. And they called on the US healthcare system and workers to um, end all of this stuff. Uh, this article lasted a whole nine days. When uh, the Scientific American retracted it, they changed the title to Healthcare Workers Call for Support of Palestinians. So they negated the fact that Palestine exists. And they wrote, this article fell outside the scope of Scientific American and has been removed. In no way did they ever uh, say that the data that was presented had any factual error. So this is a very odd reason to uh, remove an article. And uh, two Hasbara groups, Voice for Israel and Committee for Accuracy in Middle East Reporting and Analysis, which is an ironic title as far as I'm concerned, CAMERA, boasted on their websites of their victory in suppressing this article. Um, now, the question is, uh, are things beginning to turn? Um, so I want to give you a positive note here. Um, the British Medical Journal in July, um, uh, several authors from the Global Alliance on War, Conflict and Health, which is a group of academics and researchers, et cetera, who um, put together a call to action to put war, violence against healthcare, settler colonialism, apartheid and occupation, wherever it occurs on the global health agenda. And they urgently focused that we look at the occupied Palestinian territories. And um, last week, I also had um, a, a statement published in the Health and Human Rights Journal that comes out of Harvard. And I reviewed all the retractions in medical and science literature. And I said, the idea that there are two equally weighted sides to a story when it comes to health in Palestine ignores the power and balance between the settler colonial state and the colonized and is thus a form of epistemicide of Palestinian realities, of evaporating their knowledge and information. And if you think about it, authors of articles on Israel are never asked to include the quote, Palestinian side, as that is deemed inconsequential, irrelevant, or biased. So what we see in much of the medical literature is the narrative of the powerful and the exceptionalism of Israel is seen as normative and defining. And just to give you um, an action item so you don't get totally depressed, I want to just share um, that Jewish Voice for Peace Health Advisory Council has um, a petition, uh, Vaccines Not Violence, which we have actually sent to Blinken, but we're also collecting signatures to use as a uh, political work. Um, it's on the, the website, jvphealth.org. Right at the bottom of the website, it says petitions, and you can click there and sign it. And we're calling for um, an end to US funding of Israel's military, uh, holding Israel responsible uh, to get COVID testing and treatment, and restoring UNRWA funding. We're trying to keep it simple and keep it straightforward. And I'm just going to close with this. Um, uh, statement that I found when I was in Gaza, we, there were a whole bunch of things that Banksy had done and no one could figure out how he'd gotten there. Uh, but this was one of his things. And he said, if we wash our hands of the conflict between the powerful and the powerless, we side with the powerful. We don't remain neutral. So thank you very much. So I think we move to Q&A now. 
So if people want to ask a question, uh, just put an, uh, in, the, in the chat, just write the word stack and I will call you. I'm just putting the, um, the website, jvp.org. Whoops, I did, sorry, that's a mistake. Forget it, try this one. Yes, okay, there we go. So on jvphealth.org, you can find our monthly media watch, which I organize, which uh, reviews all the health and human rights issues that have erupted that month. There's a weekly COVID-19 timeline, which reviews everything I can find in the English literature on the status of COVID-19 in Israel-Palestine and a whole bunch of other uh, things. We do webinars and all sorts of other things. And I have put Alex, Alice's list of additional readings into the chat. Questions, comments? Um, Alice, that was fantastic. Um, so I'm Chuck Cowan. I've been to, to Gaza as part of a delegation from the Washington Physicians for Social Responsibility six times. The last time we were there was actually starting on March 1st, 2020. Ooh. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Yeah, we had permission for a 10 day uh, stay and at day five, you know, all hell broke loose and, and the border was gonna be closed and, and all of our flights had been canceled. And it was like a crazy mad dash out of, out of uh, Gaza. Um, saying goodbye to our friends was, was very, very difficult at that moment. And I think that you did a fa fabulous job. I really appreciate it. I want to um, see the all the all the information that you shared, which is terrific, and share it with all my friends. So can't add anything. I think you you pegged it a hundred percent correctly. I think the I think the the question though is, and has been the question for years now, is where is there any hope? And frankly, um, having gone to Gaza. First time in 2005, I think, or 2007, I can't remember. And then serially um, almost every year from 2014 to 2020, including one of the years that we were together. Can't remember which one it was. Mm -hmm. um, I think 17, maybe. 17, maybe. Yeah, it could be it's all, all kind of a blur right now. Um, was that, you know, every time we went back, it was the same story. We saw exactly the same things. We always visited the sewage flowing into the sea. We went to refugee camps. We talked to people. We interviewed the, the director of, of UNRWA, on and on and on. Our, our host agency was Gaza Community Mental Health, um, which was an, an extraordinary, extraordinary program trying to take on the mental health needs of, of uh, 2 million people um, who virtually all have PTSD. Um, Nevertheless, you know, the, the, the dilemma was that, that uh, year after year, we'd see go in and we'd see some roads repaired. We'd see some buildings repaired. We'd actually see new buildings going up. And then the next year, we'd go back after one of the wars and they'd all be collapsed. Um, the remarkable thing, though, is, is the resilience of people. Uh, it just, just amazed me. I, I did talks at uh, one of the medical schools um, uh, at least a couple of times. I think they have four or five medical yeah. schools, something like that. And, and imagining trying to decide to become a physician, go to medical school, try to imagine getting postgraduate training, which of course is completely denied. And yet, yet um, the attitude of people was, was remarkably positive. I could never quite figure that that dilemma out is how, I mean, you'd see, for example, um, wedding ceremonies and wedding ceremonies would would happen there'd be a wedding hall and people would be streaming out of the wedding hall with cars honking and lights sharing and just an entire celebration with really nothing um, in terms of how to put it together and this certainly was not the poorest of the poor and yet people are doing that so life was going on but um, I'm still trying to grasp how you can come together and feel anything positive. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I do agree with you that um, it's very hard to feel positive about the trend in Gaza because 
um, things get sort of recurrently worse. And um, the disorder between Hamas and Fatah and the Palestinian Authority um, are in such a stalemate. And um, I do agree that the population is very resilient, but there is also a massive amount of depression and post-traumatic stress disorder. There have been some studies that have come out that 90% of the children have PTSD from the last assault. And in Gaza, you know, PTSD is not a diagnosis because it's ongoing stress disorder because it's never post. Um, so it is very hard to feel positive. On the other hand, um, one, there are several things that I find interesting. During the last assault, first of all, the Hamas, however you feel about Hamas, actually hit several Israeli things that they wanted to hit. And I think it was a big surprise for Israel that they just didn't knock out their, you know, their undirected low level missiles that they have. And so even though I don't think that's the way to move forward, it was a, a shocker for Israel that people in Tel Aviv were, you know, hiding in bomb shelters and the Israelis were really scared that they would get hit with a Hamas bomb. And, um, so that was an interesting dynamic. The other interesting dynamic was that for the first time, uh, Palestinians in the Palestinian towns and Palestinian part cities uh, in Israel uh, went out and protested against the assault in Gaza. And um, it gave me the sense that there is a tr sense of unity between Palestinians living in Israel and Palestinians living in Gaza, and that the Palestinians in Israel are actually really fed up with, you know, 72 years of racism and, you know, oppression and second class citizenship and all the things that we know about Palestinians living in Israel, and they were finding solidarity with their brothers and sisters in Gaza. The other thing that happened that was really interesting was that the West Bank exploded and there were protests all over the West Bank, severely put down uh, by the Palestinian Authority, which uses the same tactics and military equipment as the Israeli government, um, and Israeli soldiers, so because they work in cahoots. But this was new too. So this was the first time there was solidarity between all the Palestinians in the historic Palestine, um, which is a big change. Um, the other thing is that even though medical journals um, have this really horrible habit of retracting or refusing any information about Gaza, more is coming out. And even when things get retracted, people have read the stuff. We have PDFs of the articles. You know, the, the information is much more accessible. And I think um, with social media um, and all, all this reporting from the ground, um, that there's much, much more awareness of what the realities are. And when I see sort of the viciousness of Hasbara organizations, you know, I mean, I know the authors of the Scientific American Journal and they're getting death threats. Um, you know, that's a measure of desperation. That's not a measure of a powerful country that feels no one can touch them. So, you know, I can hope that we're getting to a tipping point in some way. I have no idea. And I have no idea if it's gonna happen or how it's gonna happen. And I also think there are two forces that are changing the dynamic. One is the boycott divestment sanction movement. Um, I mean, just look at how the Israeli government responded to Ben and Jerry's. I mean, it's kind of ludicrous, but you know, Norway and all these countries can withdraw their pensions and major corporations can pull out of the West Bank and SodaStream can move and oppress Bedouins instead of West Bankers. And all these big things happen and Israelis don't even flinch, but take away their ice cream and they have a massive nervous breakdown. So this is not, this is, very um, a, a very powerful statement as to how important the BDS movement is and how damaged the Israeli uh, reputation is. And you know, if you look at Americans, you know, in the U.S., there's a shift in how more much more sympathy towards the Palestinian narrative, towards Palestinian suffering, way distinct from how our ridiculous Congress is behaving. Um, and so that's like a really important thing as well. And the other thing that's really important in the conversation is the whole issue of intersectionality. I think when Black Lives Matter came out and said they stood in solidarity with Palestine, this like changed everything. Because um, 
you know, black people can recognize racism when they see it. They can recognize police brutality when they see it. And to call it what it was, was really important because up until that point, I think it was really hard for the African-American community to stand with Palestine because African-Americans have worked with Jews on civil rights movement and all sorts of housing and all sorts of things that we share. Um, and so they didn't want to offend their Jewish friends. And now they're sort of permissioned to sort of separate on that. And that's freaking Jewish people out as well. And so this intersectional stuff, I think also gives a lot of power to the movement. It is glacial, this movement. And, you know, I worry every day for everyone living in Gaza. And, um, you know, there's a brain drain and it's, you know, a really hard place to live. And we can talk about resiliency, but people are hungry and children are underweight and pregnant women are anemic. And, you know, People are not getting paid for their salaries and all these lovely educated young people graduate and have a 70% unemployment rate. And, you know, how long can you be resilient in that circumstance? Uh, we have two questions. Eva Rutman. Hi, um, I'm in Melbourne, Australia at the moment. So this Hi. is quite an amazing um, thing to be part of. Um, I'd just like to say that I feel very emotional about a lot of the material that you have presented. Um, I've lived in Israel, I speak fluent Hebrew, and I have been part of an organisation that's taken children from the Erez crossing who are sick to hospitals in Israel. And I've had many Palestinian doctors and nurses look after me. So just to be clear, the hospitals in Israel are probably the oases of non-racial co coexistence a very you know so there are places where people do treat each other like people and um i think racism exists globally we have it in australia very very seriously so let's not just make israel the only bad boy in the block because they are not there are many people many in many um and the other thing i'd like to ask you is thousands of rockets were sent from Gaza, from Gaza and gave a lot of PTSD to a lot of children whose whole lives live underground in Sterot. Where, do the, where does Hamas's responsibility lie for not investing in rockets and tunnels, which Israel is scared to give them concrete and all those sorts of things, and let them through because they're scared of, of, of tunnels coming into Israel. Where do, where is, where's Hamas's responsibility who were voted in by their people in looking after their people and putting priorities on medication, COVID necessities, basic water, et cetera, et cetera, instead of thousands of rockets to send towards Israel? I mean, really, what, what's the priority here? Oh. So, yeah. I'm, I think you've made some very important points. I don't think that Israel is any better or worse than us or Australians. You know, we live in countries that have histories of settler really? colonialism and histories of racism. And so we share a lot. I, I have in no way think that Israel is the only bad boy on the block. I think we're all in this together, first of all. Um, in terms of Hamas, first of all, I am not in any way a supporter of Hamas, just to have that on the table. Um, I think the thing to look at is that in 2000, I think it was six, um, there was a, a democratic election that was certified by Jimmy Carter, where Hamas won the legislative council in Gaza. And the whole world freaked out because the history of Hamas and all the horrific things they do. Um, and put uh, a siege in place. And um, then the following year, there was a civil war and Hamas took over Gaza. And what I have heard from a lot of Palestinians who really despise Hamas and do despise the Palestinian Authority as well, that Hamas won not because people supported you know, bombing Israel, but they won because Fatah was so corrupt and so unable to get uh, a peace and that they were desperate for a clean government. And that if they had been given the opportunity to try living under Hamas and they didn't like what they were doing, they would have voted them out in the next election, but they never had the chance. So I think that we have to be careful sort of 
it's like we are not all Trumpers. You know, you can't paint Palestinians as all Hamasniks because Hamas is in power for a lot of very complicated reasons. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I think that when we look at Hamas throwing rockets into Israel, this is um, a human rights violation. This is completely unacceptable. I don't think, I'm not defending that at all. I think you have to look at the run up to the war and what was going on. The Israelis were provoking, um, were being uh, provocative in East Jerusalem. They were stopping people coming to Al-Aqsa Mosque and Ramadan. They were blocking Palestinians from coming in to, East, to Jerusalem. They were doing all sorts of things. And it was like they were poking and poking and poking and uh, enraging people and shooting people on Al-Aqsa and just being really, um, provocative. And so the way I look at it is that they poked and poked and poked until militants in Gaza couldn't stand it anymore and they started bombing. And, and Alice, Alice, it takes second, years not, of infrastructure to, you couldn't wait for the poking. They'd already had their arsenal. I'm not done. So I think that if you're blaming Hamas, you have to put it in the context of Israeli behavior. And also, if you think about who has been most destructive, who has killed more people, had, you know, created more PTSD. It's not a contest, but the Israeli uh, Defense Force has caused much, 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 much more damage than what Hamas has done. I don't defend what Hamas has done, but I certainly don't defend what the Israeli Defense Force has done. And I think, you know, this whole issue of not allowing construction in because they're worried about the tunnels. The tunnels were built during the siege. Right now, you know, in the last war there were tunnels and they somehow built them during a siege. So refusing to let, collectively punishing the entire population of Gaza and not allowing people to rebuild their homes and rebuild their sewage treatment plants and rebuild their hospitals because they were worried about tunnels doesn't make sense to me because the tunnels were built anyway. So I think collectively punishing all of the people in Gaza because of the behavior of Hamas is really short-sighted because it only builds more desperation, more violence, uh, more people who have nothing left to lose. And that's not a good formula for moving forward. So that would be some of my responses to your questions. Barbara, so I, Barbara Bernie, you have a question? Well, I, Alice, I just wanted you to talk about uh, what, <laughs> hi, what, uh, what we could do besides sign the petition. Um, okay. Well, that's, you know, the big million dollar question. So by we, you mean medical people or public health people or people of the universe or Americans or what? All of the above, all of the above. Uh, public health people, medical people and others. Okay. So, you know, from my point of view, there are different levels of response. Um, at the most basic level, I think we all need to be educated on what's going on. And um, that means, you know, staying in touch with what's being published in the Haaretz or Al Jazeera or Manda Weiss or Electronic Intifada, like paying attention to um, the realities and then sharing it with your communities, whether it's medical communities or church communities or whatever activist communities or local communities or Rotary Club or whatever it is, American people still don't have a clue. And you know, when I do presentations, people will say, well, wait a minute, who's occupying who? You know, So like basic stuff isn't out there. And I think that as we educate ourselves and educate our communities, we also have to hold our media to account. So every time uh, you hear something on even liberal media like NPR or New York Times or whatever, and it's like doesn't sit right, or you think that the framing is off or the way that people are described is really grossly inaccurate, you got to tell them. There's got to be this constant sort of nibbling at mainstream media to make it clear that we're not just reading the stuff and believing it, that there has to be more accountability. And I have to say that the New York Times, which has an enormous number of problems, actually hired a new bureau chief um, who's been much, much, much better on this and much more even handed as far as I can tell. Uh, his name is Kingsley. And I, and I think he, there's something weird and changing going on in the New York Times. Um, the other thing is that although we have a Congress who can barely um, do anything, I think we have to keep being in contact with our elected representatives and make them really annoyed that we're constantly there and constantly calling them on it and encouraging them to sign uh, Betty McConnell, um, 
Betty McConnell? No, it's not Betty McConnell. Benny, Betty, Betsy McConnell's bill, the one that supports um, stopping military aid that affects bombing children. Um, so there, I think we have to pay attention to that. Um, we also need to be uh, listening to the leadership that's coming out from the Palestinian community in the United States. What I saw in the last, you know, 25 years or so is that it used to be that, you know, if there was a protest, it would be a lot of, you know, lefty Jews and Christian people and a few Palestinians or Arabic people. Um, McCollum, you're right. Sorry, I blocked on her name. Um, and um, now when there's a protest, there are a lot of young people, young Arab people. There's a lot of African-American people. It seems like there's a whole new burst of leadership and young leadership um, that we need to pay attention to and we need to listen to. And then we need to support uh, the boycott divestment sanction movement because I think that that is a very powerful tool. And you know, it, whether it's going to your local grocery store and calling them out on carrying Israeli wines that have their vineyards in the West Bank in vineyards that are in occupied territory and blah, blah, blah. You know, you can do that local stuff. You can be involved on more, uh, you know, international movements, but that's another thing uh, to be doing. Um, so those are some of the things that I think about. I mean, for years, we've trying to get, you know, APHA to take more positive stands um, on this issue. And it's like an uphill battle, but you don't have to give up. You have to keep coming back and have another resolution or, you know, I mean, that's what organizing is about. Um, so I think it's all that stuff that we just got to keep going. And of course, it's like a totally ridiculous environment to be doing this work because we're recovering from Trump and we have this country that's like so divided and half of it's so reactionary. And I mean, there's so much on our plate, but it's really important to keep doing all of the things that we do. I have a question from Pat Kelly. You're, you're muted, Pagan. Muted. I'm uh, Alice. That was fabulous. Um, but um, I, I would like to suggest that um, as healthcare workers, we've had the privilege of education as nurses, physicians, public health people, and the Washington Group has actually really done a regular job over the past 16 years of providing some sort of concrete assistance, however minimal it is, and understanding. The, limit, the complete limitations of that tiny bit of assistance in the face of the, the terrible power against it. So I, um, I just heard about somebody who, who with a, a group of physicians, did a, um, some sort of webinar for physicians in Gaza on um, resilience. And um, I feel like I felt like this when I did migrant work, my work with migrant families on the border in Arizona. I understand the policy stuff, but I, I'm also a healthcare worker and I want to do something to lay hands on. And I just wonder whether there isn't something else that we can do to let our colleagues in Gaza know, <laughs> again, that they're not alone. What are resiliency, what, how do you build resilience in a refugee camp? How do you build resilience in the face of uh, and apartheid resistance. Um, how do you, what are concrete strategies for dealing with PTSD? Um, I, I don't know whether there's any appetite for that sort of thing, but um, I, I always want to move beyond. I want to remember my education and the privilege of that education. So, you know, I, I understand that urge and, and we have actually um, talked with various people about, you know, what can we do that's more concrete? Um, and um, is this still working? I've got Zoom up here. I don't know, is everybody seeing that? Um, so I can say that, for instance, the Gaza Community Mental Health Program, which is a major uh, program that both trains mental health workers and provides mental health, um, is eager to do webinars where they can, it's like CME webinars, where they can improve their skills. I mean, they have tremendous skills because you know, we don't need to teach Gazans about being resilient. They could teach us how to be resilient, but you know, there are therapists that would like to hone their skills, that would like to know what the most up-to-date approaches are, that would like to talk out difficult cases, that kind of thing. So I know that the Gaza Community Mental Health Program has been open to that kind of thing. Um, we haven't been able to organize it, uh, but it's certainly something that people could um, work on doing. Um, if uh, you look at the group, We Are Not Numbers, which is this group of young writers that I work with, um, supporting people who are 
creating, you know, creating a voice from the ground and then getting it out in the public is a very powerful thing. So if people have writing skills or um, mental health skills, because these writers have tremendous amount of trauma, you know, that's something that could be offered to the We Are Not Numbers group. I'm in charge of the mentoring. So if people are interested in mentoring, I'm the person to talk to. So those are two groups that I can think of. Um, it's also just giving financial support. I mean, supporting uh, like the mental health program or UNRWA in Gaza, or I mean, they need everything. So those are the kinds of things that we can do from our privileged position in the States that I, that I know of, and I'd be happy to hear what other people have to say. Um, so I would just I would just comment since I since I have been um, someone who's gone to Gaza a bunch of times um, with with the medical group and one of the most important things that I've learned over uh, a series of years um, when I first began this journey I thought what can I as one doc possibly do um, to affect anything with a ten day visit um, but. One of the things I found out is, is just what the, the last speaker, whose name I forgot already, um, said about what you can do is just being there. The most important thing is that, that Gazans feel invisible, completely invisible. And if you can find some way to go there to just say that, and even a very few people, it's amazing how how your presence and information spreads through a community just from a, a, a couple of visits, um, it has a profound effect. No, it doesn't solve all the problems in any sense. It's a pittance, frankly, but um, it is important. And so if anyone on this call wants to um, talk to me about how we got there and, and whether you would be interested in joining um, one of the delegations, uh, we, we don't know when we're going to go next. We hope we're going to go next spring, maybe, maybe in the fall. We don't know. Because um, actually getting permission to get into Gaza, which we get through, through the invitation of GCMHP, um, is very, very difficult. The Israelis don't want us to go. Um, but nevertheless, it's possible. It's arduous. It's a little bit scary. Um, frankly, I was always more afraid of the Israelis than I was of people in Gaza because the way you get treated at the border, be that as it may. Um, so it's possible to do that. And there are probably other organizations um, that, that have access to being in Gaza even for a few days. And so I think that's a meaningful um, uh, um, contribution. And um, I guess I just wanted to say something back to um, Eva, I think it was Eva, who made the, who made the very appropriate comments about Hamas, which I totally agree with, is that there's the other factor is that um, every single time there was a war, um, it preceded a, a critical election for Netanyahu. Netanyahu you provoked in some different ways a confrontation to help his political ambitions. And, and I think those, those kind of, um, those kind of events happen again and again. And it's all about poking the other guy in the eye. You poke me in the eye, I'll poke you back. You poke me in the eye. It's childish behavior. It's, uh, I mean, think about what the Republicans are doing these days in terms of amazingly childish behavior. It happens. Um, that's not to excuse sending, you know, 4,000 rockets just indiscriminately. I think it's, it's, it's absolutely atrocious or wasting resources that could be developed inside. No question about it. My experience with, with what people said is if they had another election, Hamas would be out in a minute. Hamas um, maintains its power with a huge system of nepotism. You know, if you're a Hamas member, you get a little more food from UNRWA. There's all kinds of crazy stuff that's happening in terms of supporting. On the flip side, the fairly incompetence of, of Fatah, it's like looking at, looking at you know, the, the, the bizarre incompetence of the Democrats and Republicans to get anything done. Um, maybe not a good analogy, but nevertheless, you know, one of the realities. So um, 
though there's there's a lot of blame, I think that the, that what Alice said is is to look at the balance of blame, and the balance of blame does not side with the Israel with with the Palestinians. The balance of blame um, sides, from my perspective, with Israel. Nevertheless, that argument is silly because it doesn't get you anywhere. It doesn't doesn't help you to move forward with an intractable situation. And so um, from a humanitarian point of view, if that's the perspective that, that I think I maintain, that I think Alice has talked about, that other people have talked about, from a humanitarian point of view, there is plenty of reason to validly support people in Gaza, excluding Hamas, but validly support the human beings there. And so that's, as a physician, that's, that's my perspective, is the humanitarian perspective. Eva? I just want to say, I, ha I agree with everything you said. It, two wrongs do not make a right. Um, and, but I just question the priorities of the Hamas people who are in charge in caring for their own people and to what extent they care, to what extent it's all about power for them, and therefore they've made their situation worse and their people more angry by making them more miserable and giving them so little. If not, it really, it's quite, you know, it's, it's, you've got to be careful, you know, they could have helped them so much more. They get a lot of money from other sources and I just think they use it for the wrong things for their own benefit and I think it's horrific that these are their people. If they don't care about their own people, how should the rest of the world... I mean, Israel and Gaza and Palestine and the whole conflict is not the only conflict going on in the world where people are suffering terribly and being taken advantage of. I mean, from Myanmar to Burma to China, it's, it's you know, and, and I think it's really problematic to make it about Israel because I think you've got to only get a big back push from that. I'm not saying that they're very, if they're racist. There's no doubt about it, they're racist. But show me somebody who isn't. Show me the Americans that are not racist. They're okay. history. Thank you. So, I mean, thank you very much. Sorry, I just felt I had to respond. So I think, you know, I think we all agree that Hamas is not good for people living They're in their own people. No question about that. But I do want to say that Hamas is not monolithic. It's a very complicated organization. It runs a huge number of hospitals and schools and orphanages that take care of people that no one else cares about. So I think we can criticize Hamas up to the flying to the moon, but the other fact is that they do do a lot of social service. And um, it's not something that people know a whole lot about. Um, and the other thing is the reason that I focus on Israel, uh, and you know, I think you're absolutely right, Myanmar, Yemen, I mean, we could list all of the countries where people are having a horrific time. Israel gets $3.8 billion from the US military support and a huge amount of political support and other kinds of support more than any other country. So because we are giving them that much support, we are responsible for what that support does. And the other thing is that Israel promotes itself as a liberal democracy. And I think it's a falsehood to say this is a liberal democracy where Jews have privilege over non-Jews, that those are like two things that don't walk in the same street. So a lot of us feel very compelled, given the level of American uh, complicity and support, and given what we see as sort of a basic untruth about Israel, uh, that we have to work to change this. And you know, the United States has enormous number of flaws, but I do think we have a civil rights movement. We have a concept that black people should be equal to white people. We have, you know, we're light years where we need to be, but at least there's a struggle about it going on. And the problem for me in Israel is that I don't see that struggle, that we can't even get to square one where there's a public um, understanding that the Nakba actually happened, that 750,000 people were displaced, that thousands were killed, that land was taken. I mean, 
this is a, you know, we all, as settler colonial states, we all have our basic uh, founding mythology, and then we have our basic founding reality. And unless Israel struggles with that basic founding reality, it's never going to move beyond where it's stuck. So that's part of why I feel so um, compelled to talk about this stuff. And um, I think it's tough stuff, and I, and I hear you. I want to thank you for being with us, Alice. And um, thank you all for joining us. Well, thank you.